have read this book. Uh, I am almost through this book, and I will say it is terrifying, honestly terrifying. Like, I'm reading this book, and, you know, I've always, as long as I can remember, walked with an assurance uh, of whose I am and where I'm going. But I'm reading through this, and I'm like, oh, Lord, <laughs> if there's, uh, seriously, if there's unforgiveness in my heart, Lord, like, weed it out now. And so she has a dynamic testimony. I don't know what the Lord has for us, what you're going to share, uh, but I'm excited and uh We've known Lori, I don't know, how long has it been? Okay, wow, wow, even longer than I thought. Wow, that's incredible. So um, would you welcome Lori as she comes? And, you know, I just give her <laughs> liberty to share whatever the Lord's put on your heart. I want to pray for you. Is that okay? So, Father, I just thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation uh, on Lori, on each one of us. I thank you for giving her the tongue uh, of the learned Lord that her uh, tongue would be the pen of a ready writer, Father, and that you would give us hearts that are open and willing and receptive, ears to hear, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello. It's good to be back here. I have, um, I brought with me somebody who, who, is, who has something she'd like to share. So... I believe in discipleship. I'm going to sit over there because her mama wants it on video. Lord, make her not nervous and help her share what it is, her three minutes. Help her share her three minutes. Amen. Wait till I sit down. Hi, I'm Jubilee Revive Grace Evanson, and I'm 10 years old, and I'm from Kansas City, and I have 11 siblings. I'm the fourth oldest. My favorite color is blue. My favorite dessert is deep fried cheesecake. Um, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot missionary and help missionaries go to where they need to go. And my favorite Bible verse is Psalm 23. My dad is a Costco baker. My mom is a homeschooler. I mean, she helps homeschool people. I came yesterday on my first flight on an airplane, and my favorite part of it was above the clouds. And I had to work for $175 to get here. I worked, and I cleaned cars and anything else. They told me to clean. And why I'm here is to tell others about Jesus and to get better at preaching. I do a discipleship with five others, and we it's a 10-week thing, and we're on nine weeks. And the first thing we do is eat, and then we share the memory ver um, the Bible verse we memorize. And we mem if we memorize 10 Bible verses, we get $10. And the seven areas in Christian should do is pray, worship, tell others about God, give, read the Bible, gather together at church, and come together in deliverance of your sins. My favorite part of the um, discipleship is uh, was a part of where is God in suffering? He is closest to the hurting. I can help others by praying, giving time, of giving time and talent, sharing about Jesus, do a chore, make food, and be available. I, I'm going to read Psalm 23. Somewhere. Oh, there. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sakes. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will, feel, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You are my rod and my staff. They come for me. You will prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and 
mercy, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to pray. God, thank you for this day and that I get to tell others about you and that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and that you will prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, and that you will anoint my head with oil. In Jesus' name, amen. She did good. Wait just a minute. Can I have two people other than her grandma tell her how she did, please? Because you know how the enemy is at beating us up. Is there, is there two people that w won't mind standing up? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? There we go. Amen. Thank you. Jubilee, will you take this with you, please? Thank you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay, Jubilee, she... Thank you, everyone. I um, I love it. I travel with with different people. I disciple. I love it when my grandchildren have earned enough money, and and as she said, she has um, she actually has twelve siblings. One lives in heaven now, but she has. Um, they're all working hard to earn money so that they can buy those airplane tickets to come with me. And then when they come, they all have to prepare a talk and, you know, ask them a lot of questions. And then they have to, they have to share. And wherever we go, they get to talk to people about Jesus. And so it's really remarkable that God lets me help my grandbabies. All right, let me pray. Oh, God, help me today. In Jesus' name, amen. I have some scriptures, three scriptures I'd like us to read. You know, I went to Bible college, and back then they taught me three was great. So I kind of stick with that, you know, for the Trinity, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. And uh, when I give four, I figure the fourth one is for me. I don't want you to record me, sweetheart. Thank you. <laughs> Your mama doesn't care what I say. <laughs> John... 14 verses 1 through 7 is the first scripture. John 14, 1 through 7. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him 
and have seen him. Hallelujah. All right. My second and third scripture are over in Matthew 7. So number two is Matthew 7, 13 through 14. It says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Scripture number three is 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. Pretty heavy-duty scriptures here. So I came for two things. I came first to ask you for help and then to tell you heaven stories. All right. So I, everyone here, uh, there's enough in the back that if, um, if you didn't get one, I know I said one per household, but if you didn't get one, please take one. So you should have gotten a packet when you came in. Um, the heaven book, the hell book, and a, and a card. And I'd like to ask for your help. You see, I'm trying to become a New York Times bestseller. That's a pie in the sky dream. This book, when I made this book, I tried to make this one a New York Times bestseller. You have to sell 9,000 books in one week, or you can pre-sell them. And that counts as day one. So last time, I worked 12 weeks, traveling all over for 12 weeks. It came, the book was released, and we were 500 copies short of making the New York Times bestseller. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, it gets plastered everywhere in every airport. It gets plastered as the number one book to read. That's very helpful. It gets translated into Spanish and another language, and I want it translated into Chinese because I was there with the Underground Church of China, and they need more uh, spiritual things. So that would be great. Also, book clubs around the world, so I'm talking atheists, agnostics, every sort of religion, read that list, New York Times bestseller. And so we can reach a whole lot of people if we make it. Some, some testimonies about having tried. So this book got left on a cruise ship. There was a couple, they were going on the cruise to, um, to tell their family they were gonna get a divorce. I figured a cruise would be a good way to tell them, got me. Anyway, they read the book. One of them started reading the book, realized this is a great sin, and if we do this, we're going to go to hell. And so the husband got saved, though the whole family got restored. Hallelujah, praise to Jesus. Another cool story is it got left on an airplane going to Dubai. Dubai is a far, long trip. So the lady had the whole chance to read it, realized her in her religion was going to go to hell, and so she got saved, got her mother saved, and now she's, she's filling up a little church over there in Dubai with all kinds of people because she just walks around with this one copy. She can't get it there. She walks around with her one copy telling people, no, this is what it says how you repent. So hallelujah. Recently, I got a testimony from a, um, from a man in uh, the Chicago area, and he wanted to tell me that um, somebody got, gave him the book to read. And he said, you know, he likes the supernatural stuff. So he read it, and he realized he was going to hell. Let me tell you his story. When he was 16, his dad died. And between the ages of 16 and 18, he said his mother became a bear. And he couldn't wait till he was 18 to leave home. So he left home, never to return, never to talk to her again. It had been 25 years. He's married, has children. She, he, he, he has no way of connecting with her. And he figured that's what she deserves. But he realized unforgiveness was going to take him to hell, so he got a hold of her. And he figured, you know, he'd be, he'd be the Christian man 
and get a hold of his mom, and he was not prepared for what she said. He, she told him that when the dad died, he'd left so many bills they were going to lose the house. And so mom worked three jobs to try and keep the house. But she could see her boy was struggling with the death of the dad and was getting involved with the wrong crowd. So she kept making things stricter, giving him more chores, giving him more things to do to try and keep him at home because she was gone all the time. And when he turned 18, he just left. Mom sold that house quickly to get a private investigator to go find this boy. And she couldn't find him. He said he was tore up thinking that he was so righteous. Isn't that what pride does to us, make us so righteous? Anyway, so now he's going to take his children to go back and meet their grandma, and he wants her to be a number one grandma in their life. Isn't that beautiful what Jesus can do? That's because, you know, we got to talk about eternity. Are we going to heaven or hell? And there is no purgatory. I grew up Catholic, believing there was a purgatory. And when I found out that there's not, I felt very tricked. I thought it was very wrong to tell people there's, there's another place you can go, when reality is you can only go to heaven or hell. So anyway, I gave you three things, and these three things are not for you. Even though I gave them to you, I want you to give them to a lost person. So it's like, who? I don't know any lost people. Well, then give it to your mailman or the person that you meet at the, at the Kroger grocery store or, or give it to the man who comes to cut your grass or repairs um, something broken in your house. There's lots of lost people around. But um, we're giving you this. Mike and I purchased this book the heaven book for you to have. And I have a uh, benefactor who's purchased the hell conspiracy book for you to have to take to a lost family member, a friend, a coworker, because something has shifted. We are running out of time. The nation has shifted. We are in a whole new time period. And you know, I've been to other nations where it's illegal to share your faith, where it's illegal to change someone from being Muslim to being Christian. It's illegal to help a Hindu become Christian. And that is coming here. So right now, we have to step up our game. And so I brought to you for your loved one this new book, Encountering Heaven. It doesn't come out yet. It's not even out yet. So I got a few copies. Mike and I bought a few copies early, and we want to share them with you so that your family and friends can get saved. It does come out May 18th. And so I want to make this one, so then we want you to read it and give it away. There's also a card here. This card's also not for you. Isn't that something? You didn't get any. I gave you a gift, and none of it's for you. So this card is, is if, if, if you can help me, I want you to mail this card. Put your return address up there so people know it's from you. Mail it to a Christian that you know who does not live in the Flint area. So to make the New York Times bestseller, I have to sell 9,000 books all across the U.S. I have to come from every kind of city. And we, we created a marketing program, and I'm almost done, and then I'll start telling heaven stories. We created a marketing campaign called 100% In. I prayed. I asked the Lord, what's the name of it? He said 100% In, and I am. So my husband and I raised a lot of money to buy the heaven books to give to you, and then we raised $16,000 to be gone 16 weeks. Last time I did 12, just missed it. This time I'm doing 16 weeks. So I've been traveling all over, $1,000 each weekend, which is not hard to spend with the airplane tickets, hence they have to buy their own tickets. <laughs> but so we raised the money. We're traveling all this time to take it to other people. So we are 100% in. And my grandchildren, last Sunday, um, I happened to be preaching in the Kansas City area, was the first Sunday dinner I've had with my family since the beginning of February. So, I mean, it's taking a toll on everybody. But if one person gets saved, it's all going to be worth it. I'm asking you to consider being 100% in with me. And what that means is you're going to help me make the New York Times bestseller list. To do that, you need to invest $100. I know $100 is a lot of money. 
But if you can invest $100, you do that by going online and pre-ordering five copies of the New Heaven book. These books are 20 bucks, um, and you have to order them like uh, christianbooks.com, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles. You have to order it on there. And if you order it, if you're going to order five, please, I brought the hell books for you. Take five of these so you have the matching companion. The benefactor who's purchasing these believes that many people can get saved. So if you're going to order five, take five of the hell book. And um, if I need to send more, I'll send them to Pastor Ed. So that's number one. Number two, when you get your five books, pray 100 minutes, 20 minutes for each book before you give the stack of books to somebody. Pray for 20 minutes for their soul and believe that you're sending the Holy Spirit with them. That's number two. Number three on here is reach 100 new people. How, are you good, how can you do that? If you will write me an endorsement and get it to me on Facebook or whatever, I need your picture. If you can do that or uh, send me an email, my email's at the bottom, I can use your pretty face and people will relate to you. And however you, whatever you want to say about me, if it's not good, I'm not going to share it, by the way. <laughs> I have a lot of people who write bad stuff about me. I'm like, they never met me. Do you know, somebody said, the reason why I want to be a New York Times bestseller is so I can make lots of money. That that's the only reason why I go around. I, I sell all my books and make lots of money. I was like, I don't sell these books. I give them away. But whatever, they don't know me. And the last one is the most important. We must give 100% glory to Jesus, even though you pray and pray and pray for your lost loved one, all glory goes to Jesus when they get saved. Even if this tool of this book helps them get saved, we didn't do anything. Only the Holy Spirit does it. Amen? Yeah. So there's what I, if you can do it, that's great. And if you can mail this to a person and invite them, if they can buy one or five or ten, you know, I was in... Um, I was in Kansas City doing a big book launch there, and one of the people who had been in my discipleship thing came. I figured she came because I did a raffle. I gave away $1,000. I figured, you know, she came because she was, a, she was, a, she was a, 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 a person at the food bank. So I figured that she came to win, and I wanted her to come to win because people have been getting saved. So far on our adventures over the, this is a week 11, I've spoken to 800 people. There's been um, 21 people saved, 19 people filled with the Holy Spirit. There's been uh, two water baptisms because people were just like, now what I do? I'm like, well, let's get baptized. And um, when we do the altar call, 90% of the churches are standing up wanting more of God, wanting to be sure that they help their family and friends make it to heaven. So it's really been an adventure. And the devil tells me every week, you're wasting all this money. I'm like, no, I'm not. People are getting saved. People are getting saved. So of the people who got saved, uh, this was, I mean, there's been lots of them. But, but what was remarkable was I started, I said, you know, nobody thinks they're going to hell. Nobody. The question is, are you sure going to heaven? So let's come at it from that direction. Are you sure you're going to heaven? And we talked and talked. You know, I told heaven stories. And a, and, a, and a woman came forward. And I know this lady. She she goes to one of the churches. She's not a lady. She's a man. I would have never guessed this lady was a man. And he came up and repented for living this double lifestyle in front of God as if he's mocking God. So he repents of a homosexual lifestyle. Say the next morning at a different church, another girl hears the stories of, of heaven. Are you going to heaven? And she comes up and she confesses that she's living a homosexual lifestyle and she's the leader of the youth worship. And so, you know, I brought the pastor over, explained. She said, I didn't think you were going to narc me out. I said, honey, you need help. And we can't have sin leading the kids you know, because we don't want them warped. God is setting you free, and really he's setting them free from anything that you have. So she was so upset that I told the pastor. You know, but then he worked with her. And, but people are getting saved, and you know, 
An atheist is an easier person to lead to the Lord, and I'm going to tell you why, because that's a belief system. A homosexual lifestyle is an identity issue. It takes, only Jesus can touch your identity. Hallelujah. So great things, really, really great things are happening. So people are getting saved. But so now back to this lady that I had, had um, at the food bank that I had helped her. She was one of the ones that when I'm at home, I, I helped her. She came to the book launch. She so surprised me. You know the stimulus package that came out? She told me, she said, Lori, you need to take all of it. I'm going to use all of it and buy these books. I was like, you know, she stands at the food line because she doesn't have enough food, but she took her whole stimulus package to purchase them. And so I said, okay, well, i got to get you the same number of hell books. And so she said, now what do I do with them? I said, well, come to the food bank and help me hand them out, <laughs> you know. But so she is going to get them. Hallelujah. I mean, it's getting through. We might make it this time. We might make it with the favor of God. Amen. So there you go. There's my spiel. I need help. I think if you help me, it, you can be helping yourself at the same time. And, um, you know, I know I know. Pastor said, you're going to take an offering up for me. And um, I, I really, I appreciate it. But I really want to save souls. I really. And so, you know, if you, if you were going to, if you were going to put 20 bucks in for me, and think, well, you know, that's all I got. I can't buy that book. Please just buy the book. Take the hell book. We're running out of time for our family and friends to get saved. You know, my sister-in-law right now is fighting cancer, and uh, it looks like they're just going to put her in hospice. My sister-in-law doesn't know the Lord. You know, if you can't afford the book, there's other things that you can do. Yeah, everybody has a phone. You can text a person a scripture. I'm thinking and praying this for you today. You can go online and find a worship song. Like, wasn't, wasn't the worship sweet? You can get a worship song, get the link, and send it to them and say, listen to this. It should build up your day. There's lots of things that we can do. Send them a card. You know, take them out for lunch and tell them that you're praying for them. There's all kinds of things that we can do before they die and go to hell. And if you haven't read about what I saw in hell, please read the book because it should set a fire in us to care for the lost. we got to care. Okay, thank you for your help. Now, can I tell you about some heaven stories that's in here? <laughs> that's Jubilee's favorite. So, um, Lord, which, which ones should I tell? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. The one about the crown, I think that's our favorite. <laughs> so um, this is called the parade. So on the day that I got to heaven, and I've been to heaven many times, this new heaven book does have 15 supernatural visions of heaven, and the hell book has two. The last chapter in the hell book is the most powerful vision of heaven I've ever had. I put that in the hell book because people need to choose to go to heaven. And so I don't often talk, I, I, I don't think I've ever talked publicly about the one there. So you want to read it. But anyway, the parade. So on this time that I got to heaven, and I just want to say, it doesn't make me special that I've been to heaven. It only makes me responsible. So God sends me to heaven because of the scripture, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we don't know how they do it in heaven, we're not going to know how to do it on the earth. So that's why he shows me how I'm doing it wrong. And then I wrote about it so that other people will know how we do it wrong. But on this time, I got to heaven. And when I get there, there's usually this group, my, my, my friends in heaven. I'm not in heaven yet, but they are my friends. They've been assigned to help me pay attention. <laughs> that's my job. Pay attention, Lori. <laughs> And, but when you get there, things are so beautiful. Like, you know, when you look at this hoopla that's up there, isn't that pretty how that, and you just look at it like, how did they get that to stick? That's what happens when you're in heaven. How did they do that? And then they have to say to me, pay attention, because I'm not there to look at that. I'm there for a lesson, you know. So, so my friends in heaven, pay attention. And so when I got there, they were like, she hasn't seen the parade. She hasn't seen the parade. So all the people move, and people in heaven fly. They fly 6, 8, 12 inches off the ground. 
and your inches up are in comparison to your love for God. So you're not in competition with me. You're only in competition with yourself. How much do you love Jesus? That will determine how high you can go and how bright you can be. Now, Jesus is very, very bright. He's the brightest person in heaven, and he is in the form of a man. He kept this image. He never went back to being like he was before he left heaven. That's remarkable, that the whole cost, everything that it cost him, it's still costing him to be our king. And so Jesus shines the brightest. And how do I explain that? There isn't correct English language. I don't know that any language would have the correct language. But um, imagine a hologram where if you look at it one way, a person's looking to the left. But if you look at it another way, the person is looking to the right. So that's what that happens there a lot. And I think it will stay that way until we're all in heaven together. But when you look at Jesus, you can see that he is a man. But when he just changes just a little bit, he goes super bright. So Jesus is the brightest person in all of heaven. He's God. The next brightest people in heaven are the people we would call miscarried. And I talked with my brother who was explaining about having a miscarried baby. We have a miscarried baby um, in heaven. They are the second brightest people in all of heaven because they were loved by God, they're loved on the earth, and they completed their purpose. And so they're the second brightest. Now, why is that important? Let's say that there's no doors in heaven. There's only a light ring around the door. And if you don't meet that light ring, you can't go through that opening because you, you couldn't see anything anyway. So I'm very... I'm, I, I want to be able to go in that bright door, but I know I will never be as bright as my grandbaby who is already in heaven, but that little one can take my hand and I can go in with them. So it's an honor to have a miscarried person in your family. I know it hurts here, but all of that hurt will go away for all of eternity, that little one being able to get us in anywhere we want to go. So that's the truth of of the brightness of a miscarried person. The next brightest people are what we would call aborted people. And I want to take a minute and tell about them because there's usually somebody who needs this help. So an aborted person is, was loved greatly by God. Their mission was cut short and they were not loved by their parents. So they are the next brightest people in heaven. So if you, if you help support life, if you're pro-life and you do things that support life, these are your friends. Now, if you know somebody who had an abortion when they were young before they were saved or saved, and they repented of this sin, God moves them out of the category of having been aborted and moves them into the category of having been miscarried because their parents did love them at some point in their life. The parent did love them. And the scripture for that is love covers a multitude of sins. And God changes these people. That Those people do not know that they were aborted. They only know they were miscarried because their parents do love them. Isn't he wonderful? Our God is so powerful. Anyway, the next brightest people are you and me. And you're not in competition with me. You're in competition with yourself. Trust, obey Jesus. And by those things, you'll become bright. Okay, back to the parade. So they're like, she doesn't know, she doesn't know Jesus. She 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 hasn't seen the parade. So they get me in the front of parade and the rocks move me. Because The people in heaven can fly, but I can't fly yet because I'm still alive on the earth. So the rocks move me, and they love to help. Everything in heaven loves to help. So I get to the front, and I'm looking down at the street. It was not what I expected. I always thought that streets of gold would be like bricks. I thought it would be made out of gold bricks. 
but that's not what it was made out of. It looked like a sheet of glass, but inside of this glass was waves of gold. You know how Lake, uh, Lake Superior or an ocean, you watch all those waves, they're alive. That road was alive and the waves like the ocean were moving in it. And so you, I'm just watching it like, wow, wow. And my friends are like, pay attention. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. I didn't come to see the streets of gold. However, I mean, they were amazing. So I look up and I see these little sequins, they're drops, little liquid drops of love twirling around in the sky and they're, they're on a mission. You don't know where they're going, but some of them come to me, they get you. And when they get you, you start to giggle. You know that little one this morning that was running around here with her little flag? When you get her, when you chase her or something, she's gonna giggle. You know, because babies do this giggle. We do that in heaven. We giggle when one of these liquid drops gets you. And so it's so happy because you're getting, they're getting you from everywhere. And they just absorb right in you and bring you this joy that you just can't contain it. And so it comes out in a giggle. And so the whole, that's the noise that you're hearing is all this giggling everywhere watching this parade. And so I kept watching them, like, wow, I wonder where that one's going to go. And they never went where I thought they were going to go. They, 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 they would come this way and then zip that way. And it was really fun to watch these sequins of love. Lori, pay attention. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then I'm watching the people walking in the parade. And the scripture for this day was, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I thought, oh, that, I know that scripture. And um, it was a day before I was born. And so I was watching people who lived a day on, the, on our calendar from before I was born. And I knew what they had done for Jesus. Do you know that it says if you give even a cold cup of water in the name of the Lord, he will not forget what it is that you've done. And so it was like that, but these people had done different things. There was a man marching in the parade, and, and he had been driving down the road, praying in tongues, and noticed somebody's car needed, was flat, needed help changing the tire. So he stopped, helped him change the tire, and um, went on about his way. But the Lord counted it as something remarkable and amazing on that day. And so that man was walking in the parade that day because he loved God so much he changed the tire. And then there was a lady. She had baked a cake. She had baked a cake because this other family that she knew had already miscarried two babies, and she found out they were pregnant, and she was going to stand with them in prayer. And not only prayer, in all of her love, she baked a cake and took it to them, and the Lord counted it as being amazing and remarkable and worthy of being praised in this parade. It was really, really something. There was a man standing next to me, and he, he was... He was filled with regret, which I thought, how can you be filled with regret? I thought there's no sadness in heaven, but that sadness is deep grief. I think that sadness will be when we look around and our family and friends are not there. That type of sadness, this deep grief won't be there. But this man, he had regret. I was like, huh, like full understanding of something that should have been different. So then the people kept marching. Now, I want to tell you, you get to stay who you are. You will look like you look. You can wear what you wear. Um, so, so when people say, how will, how will people know me? So let's say my grandpa. So I was 17 when my grandpa died, and he was, um, he was in his 80s. For me, at first, he'll look like he does when he's in his 80s. But for his little girl who died when she was three, he'll look like he's 20. Your face will do that until we all know everybody. Don't worry. Everyone will know you there. And then I think sometime, maybe when we're all together, I don't know when that time will be, maybe we get to pick our face, which one we best like. And we're going to like our face because God made it. There's not going to be any trouble anymore us picking on ourselves. And so, um, 
as I looked at the people, I mean, I knew them. I was so happy to celebrate with them. And they kept marching by. They were introverts. And the introverts are still introverts. And the extroverts are still extroverts because there's nothing wrong with the way that God made us. He liked how he made us. And so, you know, maybe we're a little more introverted in that we don't share everything that's on our mind. And maybe we're a little more extroverted in that we do share all the good things of God. But we're still going to be just like us. It was amazing to watch the people march. And these little drops of liquid would kept hitting them. And if, they, if it made it to the ground, it would bounce up and, and go back alive and figure out where it wanted to go. It was so stunning to watch this parade. And the people left. And I could hear him before I could see him. It was the Lord's horse. And he walked like this. And he said, I'm the Lord's horse. I'm the Lord's horse. And he would scoot a little bit to the left in a dance, and he'd scoot a little bit to the right in a dance. He's a very talented horse. And he's big. He's like three stories tall, and he's got wings, and he's a remarkable horse. But when he would say, I'm the Lord's horse, the people would answer him, I'm the Lord's girl. I'm the Lord's one. I'm the Lord's sunshine. I like to say, I'm the Lord's favorite. You can say that too, but that's what I like to say. And it took that horse, it was really remarkable that the horse, by just stamping out his identity, it caused each of us to stamp out our own identity. Did you know that you can do that? If we declare that to one another, who we are, it makes somebody else more secure in who God made them to be. If we will just say who we are, I'm the Lord's child. I'm the Lord's kid. And if somebody else is struggling, my grandchildren and I remind them who they are. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. If we do that, like that horse, it gets in us. There's a rhythm. So here he was. He's walking along. I'm the Lord's horse. And he was so filled up with gems and jewels and diamonds. And God loves to give all sorts of sparkly things to people. So our clothes in heaven, like I said, you know, you can pick any time period you want, but they're all made of the same material. I like to wear those big bustle dresses while I'm there. You know, when I'm talking about that time period, I love those things. I look just so elegant in those but you can pick whatever you want. You can wear the beautiful clothes of India. You can, you can, wear, you can wear the t special togas. I mean, you pick. But I like the bustles. And so, but the material is made out of, if you could, if you could compress every single color in the universe into a dot, and you can in heaven, that dot becomes a sequin of light. It's not really a sequin, but that's the best thing I can explain. And it shoots out light, and so your clothes are emitting this light. And if two of us get together, then we bounce off each other and we're brighter. But when Jesus steps into our midst, we are brilliant like the sun. It's just so exciting. Our, even our clothes are very special in heaven. And so as the horse is walking by, he has this, um, this garment draping off of him. And so the hem of his garment, like here and at the bottom, um, it was filled up with leaves, L-E-A-F, a leaf from a tree. And it was never going to die. This leaf, although it was picked from the tree, it pinched the hem of that garment. And I watched that leaf, as it trailed the ground, it sent out little earthquakes. And somehow that leaf, in its little quake, was healing people. There's no sickness in heaven because a leaf does its job. I'm like, wow, you know, I believe in natural healing. I really believe in it now that I saw these leaves and what it was that they could do. I was like, wow, this is so amazing. And so the horse went by, and as the horse went by, I mean, people are cheering like you wouldn't believe. And you know, when a lot of people start cheering and laughing, you do too. 
Have you ever listened to a little one giggle? You're at a restaurant or something, and the little one starts giggling. You start laughing. You don't even know why you're laughing. It's like, or somebody's laughing so hard. You don't know what the thing is, but you start laughing. It's this contagious thing. And so in heaven, we are laughing all the time. I want to tell you, Jesus is the best belly laugher you have ever met. It's like he loves to have fun. And he loves to tell great things about the angels, about us. He loves it. So anyway, everybody's laughing and giggling and laughing. And the horse went by. And this man, all of a sudden, joined the parade. And then I knew. Oh, wow. You see, he had been alive on that day. But he had not served Jesus that day. But God put him into the parade because he was a hidden work. You're not, you don't know yet what God is going to do in this one. He's a hidden work. And so he, he joined the parade and more people cheered because of the greatness of our God, not only to save people, but to give them amazing tasks to do in his name. I was like, God, you're just so wonderful. Pay attention, Lori, pay attention. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I'm getting some of it. Like, pay attention, pay attention. And I think every time they say pay attention, it helps me like if some scribe or something is writing it down in my memory. But the parade went by, and then they were like, what did you think of Jesus? I said, I never saw Jesus. What? You didn't see Jesus? You came to heaven, you didn't see Jesus? I was like, No. And they're, ah, you know, so the plan is to get me back in front of this horse. You see, he was on the horse. But I was so excited about the horse and all of the gems and, and the horse's dancing and his identity that I didn't even think to look up. Now, the man on the horse, in comparison to the horse, was small. Jesus looked small in comparison to this big horse because he's about our size. I mean, even if he's a big guy at 6'7", which he's not, that's still small for a three-story horse. But no matter how big that horse is, it doesn't matter because God is in control. Jesus is in control of that big horse. He's never going to fall off of it. He doesn't have to worry, what if it takes off quickly? I mean, Jesus is in control. And so as they're trying, the rocks start moving me, and I, I know the goal, get back in front, look up, at the face of Jesus. But I looked up and I saw Jesus from the back riding on that horse. And when I saw him, that was it. I hit the ground in heaven. And this is the one and only time that heaven could not move me. Heaven moves me. It just tosses me around because, come here, we want to show you this, that you need to see this. But I was in worship to God because of what I saw. When I hit the ground, this noise came out of me. You know, when pastor said, let's, um, let's sing to the Lord, there's a sound that comes out of you, and it's not words anymore. You've worshipped. Everything's been so good. We're kind of in a new field. And then when he says, you know, let's, let's worship God, let your voice worship God, there's just noise that comes out. But that noise is raw worship. And that's what I had, this raw worship. And it dropped me in heaven. It allows um, a new kind of life to come in you. That raw worship allows you to become rooted in who Jesus is. And so as I hit the ground, this worship was coming out of me. Ah! And, and it was making a melody. I mean, it wasn't yelling. It was just complete adoration, devotion dedication, allegiance to Jesus. Worship can do that here in the earth. Don't miss worship. You know, I know people that, well, you know, it's too loud. Get some headphones. Well, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the, sound, the music that I really like. doesn't matter. They did a great job. Then when you get to the end, there's that little nugget of now use your voice to the Lord and something comes alive. It's powerful. It's powerful. So anyway, I'm there laying in heaven, worshiping God. I mean, I'm crying. I'm like, God, I never knew. I never knew. 
And I just, I can still remember so much light was around me, not because people were around me, but because wisdom and revelation and knowledge is light. Okay, what did I see that brought all this? When I looked up on the horse, I saw Jesus. I saw only the back of his head. I saw his crown. But what I saw was enough to change me. You see, coming out of his crown was all those liquid drops of love, like a sparkler on the 4th of July. It was shooting out from his being. Love was coming from him. Of course he knew who he wanted to send it to. And it just, it was, it was never ending. The crown itself was of glass, for lack of a better understanding, glass and light. But it was shaped in the crown of thorns. He still wears a crown of thorns on his head that is now a crown of glass that light shoots out of that liquid drops of love shoot from it. And I had never understood about the cross. I thought when the cross was done, it is finished, it's finished. Get as far away from that thing as you can. Although I'm always drawn to it. At my house, I have a crucifix with Jesus on the cross because it's what he paid for that allows me to be saved. It's what communion is about. When I take communion, I come to God because he hung on the cross. But you know what? We take Jesus off the cross, and some churches don't even want a cross in their building. They don't want to talk about the cross. It's like we're done with the cross. Heaven's not done with it. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it is because of what he did on that cross. His crown proves his great love for us. He's not ashamed. Jesus is not ashamed of the cross. Jesus is so thankful because, because of that crown of thorns, because of the wounds on his wrists and his feet, because of the piercing that's in his side, because of there not being any blood left in his body, he purchased men for God. And they're marching in a parade. It's wonderful. It's just so wonderful to know that that cross is a part of each and every day. The king who wears the crown of thorns is the only way to the Father in heaven. And, and because of him and that crown, you and I can go to heaven. It's wonderful. But not everybody's going to heaven. You see, in my father's house are many mansions. I want to give you a suggestion of what I saw. And you get to choose. We all get to choose when we get to heaven. So you can go have a mansion, your own mansion, out there by the ocean. Or you can have a mansion up in the mountains or on the prairie. You can have a large mansion if you want. But that's not what I want. You see, in my father's house are many mansions. Think of that room mansions like, like bedroom suites, for lack of a better word. And I toured my father's house. It's really remarkable. The living rooms will sit 10,000 plus people. There's this one and that one. And we know which one. Somebody says, meet you in the living room, you know because we communicate from heart to heart. We know which one you're talking about. And did you know in heaven, if I talk about you in heaven, you hear me. We should live that way on the earth. If I talk about you, you should be able to hear me. And, and sometimes God gives me that gift, not to hear when people are saying good things. I think he gives it to me because I just love everybody's soul. And I, I think the best of people. Right away, I just, I meet you, I think the best of you. Why? Because I saw Jesus, I know how much he thinks the best of you. And then, you know, I think you're my friend. And sometimes God lets me hear what people are saying. I'm like, oh, I, I, I didn't realize they're not saved yet. They don't know I can hear them. In heaven, you can hear everything people say about you, and they only say good things about you in heaven. So we need to watch our mouth. <laughs> And we should only say good things about people because what if God gives them that gift where they can hear you? Especially our children. I mean, 
Don't we say things about our kids that if they were a little older, we wouldn't say that? I mean, it's really put the spirit of conviction on me. But in the room that I went to, I, I looked in this man's room. It was a really remarkable room. I was looking up here at all of Pastor Ed's treasures, right? And, and, and in this room that I was looking at, they had lots of treasures that God had placed, lots of treasures. There was several sizes of baseball gloves from when he was a little boy until he got older. There were different baseballs that he had baseball great people. When they got to heaven, they signed a ball for him. People that he could have never even watched play baseball. The balls were there waiting. I mean, there were treasures like, like build a car together, one of, those, one of those model cars, all sorts of treasures. And I was looking at the man's treasures, and I said, where is he? Who is this? Where is he? And Jesus started to cry. You see, even though God has a room in his mansion for this man, that man died, and he's in hell. Jesus will never be guilty of not having done everything for each of us. People want to know about pets in heaven. If you loved and cared for your pet, they're in heaven. If you loved and cared for your pet, they're in heaven, which was a great surprise to me. I was always told pets don't go to heaven, so I just, that, I've just been tore up over it. But one of my little pets, when I was seven, came running to me, said to me, I love you. I'm like, who are you? Told me a snowball. I was like, wow, you're here? It's not my pet anymore. It's God's. Everything in heaven belongs to Jesus. And so my little pet is not mine anymore, although because I loved it and took care of it, it is in heaven. But there are pets that are in heaven, and their owners are in hell because the principle still works. How we doing? You guys enjoy hearing about heaven? Oh, good. Good. I see that hand. I have a story I would like to tell you right now. Not right now. No, no. I want to hear it, but not right now. I saw um, the rooms of the people at the mansion. And there's a lot of rooms in Jesus' house. So I want you to consider not, I want you to consider not choosing the mansion by the water or the mansion in the mountains. I want you to consider taking one of the rooms at Jesus' house because people don't get to see Jesus every day. You know, you think you're going to go to heaven, you're going to get to see Jesus all the time, but that's not true. Jesus is still busy, and he goes from place to place to place to place. And if you're one of his disciples, you can still go with him. But what if it takes a 1,000 years before he can come to your house again, or 10,000 years before he can come to your house again? You know, when I go places, I really like to stay with people because I might not have time to visit with you, but I can visit with you in the morning when I wake up, and before I go to sleep, I can visit with you. Wouldn't you want to see Jesus every day? And when you get to heaven, don't you want to see Jesus? Now, I want you to think about what would you like, because there are choices in heaven. And I want to live in that house. I want to live with him. I want to be able to see him every day. I want him to speak to me tell me things, give me his little treasures. I want to be so adorned with gems and jewels and special things and the breath of God on me. I love him. I love him. I don't want to be away from him. I don't want to have that mansion over there. That's not why I'm working at trying to go to heaven. And, and by working, I mean doing the things that Jubilee said. Those seven areas praying to God and reading your Bible and giving your money and telling other people and giving your talent and giving your time, making sure I go through deliverance, worshiping God, gathering together. I want, I want to do these things so well that not only am I super bright and you're all my friends, so if you're brighter than me, I want you to take my hand and take me through. But if I'm brighter than you, I want to take your hand and take you through. 
I'm living for another time. But can you imagine if we go to that time without our family and friends? If we go to that time, there is going to be tears. The tears that Jesus is going to have to wipe away is going to be the ones where we know he did everything he could. And that person isn't here because they didn't want to be. But if they knew, if they knew, would they want to be? I think they would. That's why ahead of time, you get to give your family and friends, ahead of time, you can give them the stories of heaven and make sure they understand there's another place. You can give your family and friends the opportunity to choose ahead of time, to talk to them about it. And that's my heart. God gave me a wound, and my wound is that souls are going to perish all around us. There are more people in hell than what are in heaven. That should upset us. That should cause us to be true watchmen. There are more people in hell than what are in heaven. They're never going to hear Jesus' belly laugh. They're never going to get to play with the angels. They're never going to get to see. That man never got to see the room with all the treasures that Jesus had prepared for him. And there's multitudes on that wide path. Because wide is the road that leads to destruction. And the scriptures already told us many are on that road. But, but narrow is the way that leads to God. And few there is that find it. But we can help. Now, I know not everybody in here is an evangelist like me. I know that. But my job is to come and equip you. My job is to help the church. How can I help you? And so I, I, I gave you some ideas. You know, they have to know. So, so this book is not written with a lot of scripture. I retold it. Does that make sense? I didn't, I didn't write the scripture word for word the way it is in the Bible. People say, why did you do that, Lori? Why didn't you write the scripture? Are you ashamed of the scripture? No, because here's the deal, church. We, when we see what scripture it is, we think we know it, and we skip over it. We don't read it ourselves. And yet we expect the lost people to read a language that they don't understand. And so I put the scripture in the back of each chapter. You can find it. But they need, they need the heart connect. Jesus wants a heart connect. And we can do it. How do I know we can do it? Because Jesus told us all we can do it. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations and baptize them. He should have just said for the beginning, because now we're in 2021, he should have said, go, make disciples of your family. Go make, go make disciples of the people you work with. Go make disciples of your neighbors. Because the nation, we don't really care, church, about the nations anymore. I know I'm talking to this church that does care about the nations. But as a whole, there's got to be somebody who keeps saying, what about the lost? What about the lost? What about the lost? Because we're going to lose our opportunity to speak freely. And if you won't speak now when you can speak freely, trust me, you will not speak when it's difficult. You're in training. We're all in training right now. So go get them before it's too late. Remember, the, the gift that I gave you, go ahead and read it, but you got to give it to somebody. It can't sit on your shelf or that's sin. Because it was not designed to stay in your car to sit on your shelf. you got to find somebody to give it to. Wrap it up real pretty. Give it to them as a gift. The way I did when you came in. Here's a gift for you. I'll explain it in a minute. And then if you can help me, the card, mail it to somebody because I have to sell these books everywhere. And if you can... Purchase one or five or more. Make sure you get the matching companion. And if I didn't send enough books up, I'll send more. Because we got to be committed about the lost. Okay, one more thing about heaven. Because when we get there, we're going to be very bright. Did you know it says, he who wins souls is wise. So the benefactor who bought these hell books, you know, they, if you buy it at $17, I think they paid 11 
they paid, I mean, and we've been given out a lot. I think um, they purchased 3,000 of them for me to give away. Because they believe that he who wins souls is wise. And do you know the wise will be with God? They're like, Lori, go get as many souls saved as you can. Now, I can't. 100% glory only goes to Jesus. Only goes to Jesus. So something that Jubilee shared, and she had no idea I was going to share this, but I found out, I, I teach the discipleship course that she's taking, and she's a very good student. She's learned all her scripture verses up to date. But the scripture that she's, the, the one that s- stood out to her was, um, where is God amongst the suffering? And I saw him. It was overwhelming. Imagine a room. So what it looked like to me was, have you ever seen one of those pictures where when you get up close, the picture is made with a lot of little faces, faces of people. I don't know if anyone's ever seen one of those big pictures. but So that's what the room looked like. So I just thought it was a beautiful picture that changed. I thought first we were just looking at a, at a, at a room, and the pictures went all around, panoramic, all around, up, down, around, like you were in a bubble of pictures that moved. But in reality, instead, it was like that, all these little faces. God was looking at the faces of the people. There were two people that he was more tuned into, for lack of a better understanding. Imagine all of our faces being there before God in this room. But he was very drawn to the people who were hurting. The scriptures say that God is closest to those who are mourning. Jubilee was right. And I saw him pay attention and be drawn to the people who are mourning, lost people. He's seeing every human trafficked person. We have to stop that church. The church, I think, lost part of her witness 50 years ago when we didn't do something about abortion. Church lost her witness 30 years ago when we didn't do anything about homosexuality. The church is losing her witness when we don't do anything about human trafficking, at least we can pray. You might not know anybody being human trafficked, but God, at least you can pray. And God is watching all these people who are hurting. And the only other crowd that stands out because these faces would come out because of the pain that they were in. And it was overwhelming looking at that pain. I, I, I was there a split second. I saw what I saw. It was too much for me. I wanted out. There's so many people hurting. But there was one other group that actually ministered to Jesus, and that was the people who worship. Because the scriptures say he inhabits the praises of his people. And do you know that the worshipers actually gave God strength to stand there and be present for all of the people who are hurting? It was remarkable. This church has really good worship. It's about God. Nobody up, there was, nobody up there was trying to draw attention to themselves. I really like this drummer in what it was that he was doing. It was just for Jesus. He didn't care if he's off. It's not about everybody cheering him. I really like that piano player. Could you see when she was doing this with her hands, you know? She's with God. She didn't care about us in the room. She's with God. And how the, how the singers, how they were connecting, reaching up, grabbing something. Do you know that when we worship God, not only does he inhabit our praises, but we give him strength to endure. We have no idea the pain that he's looking at. He's there. He'll never leave us, never forsake us, and we can go to heaven. But it would be a real shame if we went to heaven and our family and friends don't make it. So church, step up your game. I mean, that's an evangelist telling you to an evangelistic church that's got a big outreach plan, and I'm proud of you, but if the city of Flint is left to your care, how are you doing? And I, I say that to me in Kansas City. If, if Kansas City is left to my care about preaching the gospel, because how will they know unless they hear, and how will they hear unless somebody goes? How am I doing? We're in trouble in Kansas City we got to step up our game just a little bit. Just step it up just a little bit. 
you know, and whatever is the outreach fund. It should always be full. They should never have to worry about raising money for outreach. It should always be full. There should be like, like when Moses had to tell the people, stop bringing me stuff. The church should have to say, stop. We've got more than enough for outreach right now. Just stop. We've got to care about the lost because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus cares. Multitudes of people are not going to make it to heaven. And there are more people in hell than what are in heaven. But not on our watch. Not my family. Not my friends. Let me pray. And then we need to hear the story. Lord, I don't want to talk about you like you're not in the room. You're right here. We need... We need a new heart. God, reach inside and take our hearts of stone. It's like the world causes our heart to turn stony. Take that out and give us, God, a heart of flesh that beats like yours. Because where you are, Lord, we know there's liberty where you are. There's freedom. And we, we need this freedom, God, so wherever we go, the others can have freedom in Jesus' name. You created heaven for us. And you warned us it's a very narrow path. Please, Jesus, keep us on that path. Come and bring your great spirit of conviction. Holy Spirit, treat us like a bulldog. Make sure that we're not in sin. Come after us, God. Fill us with your light. We want to trust and obey. We want to be very, very light. We want to be so bright that we can hold one another's hands and take them into places. God, make us pro-life. Really, really pro-life so that the aborted people can take our hands and take us in to places we could never go otherwise. Have mercy on us, God. Because it's true, we're going to heaven. But teach us how to care about the lost. Teach us how to give good things to the lost, God. Teach us to encourage them, to bring them to church, to keep asking to bring them to church. Thank you, God, you're preparing clothes for us and a beautiful room with great treasures in it. You're not a respecter of people, God. Every one of my friends here would like to go to heaven. And so I pray for them, God, that you would take them to heaven. Give them visions and dreams that they can encounter you. Lord, I thank you for my little one and the other little ones that we I know of in this room, That those little miscarried ones. I know they're not called that there, but we, we didn't know what you were doing. But now we see, God, our whole family is blessed because of them all through eternity. Thank you. I want to bless, God, each one of my people here, and I want to bless, God, um, the Bible says they are... Uh, you're using them mightily for the moral outcry, and I want to bless God, Pastor Ed and Amy. God, thank you for them. Thank you for this place that you've established through them. We love you, Jesus. I want to love you more. We love you, Jesus. Say it with me. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. I love you, Father. I love you, Father. I love you, Holy Spirit. I love you, Holy Spirit. I love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know my brother wanted to tell a story, and I'll just...
I'm sorry. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, what a treasure. I agree with that. I agree. Hallelujah. And she could have been taller because she's floating up off the ground. <laughs> right. But I mean, she could have been taller. What they saw was because her robe is long because she floats. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Thank you. That's absolutely necessary. Thank you, church. Amen. Thank you. Somebody come up and play some music for a little bit as we kind of shift here. We're going to take up a second offering here um, for Lori. And I want you to take her words to heart. I mean, she said she's, I think all of our hearts should be more concerned about souls than anything. But we do want to bless her and honor her as well. So if you did not get... um, one of those books uh, that set, please, 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 and, and remember what she said. It's not for you. You can read it and be blessed. Like, I'm still reading <laughs> that book, and it's just, it's, it's doing something. It should do something in our hearts. It gives us an urgency. Yes, yes, yes. And if you make, you want to, yeah. Yep, so if we're going to take up a, a second offering here, and if you are making a check, uh, please make it payable to Gateway Hope Center, and then we will direct one check uh, to Lori and to her ministry. And um, again, if you want to get the books, if you buy five of them of the Heaven books, grab five of those uh, Hell books as well. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> so, guys, you want to come forward or? If anybody's got, yeah. So, Father, we just thank you once again, Lord. Father, give us your heart. Give us your burden for the lost, for those around us that are hurting and are dying and are on their way to hell. Father, if there's any unforgiveness in our own hearts, Father, Holy Spirit, please open up our eyes. Show us. Help us, Holy Spirit, in your mercy and in your grace, Father, that we would truly forgive from the heart in the same way that you have forgiven us. Father, open up our eyes to the lost around us, to our family members, to our friends, to our co-workers, to people we see at the store and at the gas station, driving around, Father, open up our eyes to see our neighbors. God, open up my eyes. So many times we walk around with these blinders on and we don't see what you see. Father, open up our eyes. Open 
open up our eyes. That we would be jealous and zealous for the things that are on your heart to see heaven truly come on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. To see, uh, just as you said to Adam and Eve, that, that divine mandate to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and extend the very borders of the Garden of Eden, Father, that with each person we touch, with each person we pray for and we reach, we are extending the very borders of the Garden here on earth. So, Father, we thank you. Open up our eyes, Jesus. Open up our eyes. Father, I just pray, God, that you would make a way for this message and this testimony, the experiences and the encounters that you've given, Lori, you would make a way, Father, for it to touch the ends of the earth. Father, that everyone would have a witness. Everyone would have a witness to who you are and the truth of heaven and the truth of hell, Father, that our eyes would truly be opened here on the earth. God, open up eyes. Save souls, Father. We're asking in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So, yes. So again, if you're, sorry, if you're making a check, Make it payable to Gateway, and then we'll make one check to Lord. The Lord was saying that the compassion and the depth within the revelation that's being revealed. He said, don't bypass reading the book. Because the foundation of your reaching them is going to come from the cry that's being birthed within you through the revelation that God is giving to you. When you read the book, your prayer will have a depth of reach that can go past the boundaries of the enemy. And you're giving a life to them, but it will destroy the thing that's holding them from it. I just want to pray for the lost out of Psalms 107, starting in verse 10. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subject them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and deepest gloom and broke away their chains. So, Father, we cry out for the lost all across this nation today. We cry out for your mercy, God. We cry out, break in with light and truth. Send spiritual mothers and fathers across their pathway, God. Break in with revelation. Let them dream dreams and see visions of heaven, God. We ask you that you would even give them a vision of hell and that you would warn them. You would break in, Lord. Holy Spirit, come upon them. Cause them to hear your voice. Waken them. Awaken them. Let them wake up. Send a wake-up call. Lord, we ask for your mercy today that thousands upon thousands upon thousands would come into your kingdom from this nation in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lori, so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add or say? Okay. Yes. Why don't you pray into that? Can you do that? 
I just heard when she was saying he was praying, wake up revival. So we pray, Lord. Uh, I'm just going to hold the mic out because I'm going to yell, wake up. Wake up! Wake up. Wake up all around the world. Wake up. This is a wake up revival time. The fields are white. We thank you, Lord, that you're sending the harvesters out. In Jesus' name, you say, like the scripture was, uh, compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. Give us the, the fortitude and the courage. Let the meek be, let the meek be bold. <laughs> let the meek be bold. Let the introverted be extroverted. Give us the courage and the boldness of David to go on and go out and take on Goliath. In your mighty name, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm just going to pray and bless everybody. <laughs> so, Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Lord, what you've deposited in each of our hearts, what you've shown us, what you've revealed to us, Lord, that we would, like Mary, treasure these things in our hearts and chew on them and meditate on them, Father, and let it begin to transform our lives, the way that we live, the way that we represent you every day. So, Jesus, may we not leave this place the same. Every time we encounter you, every time we come into your presence, we should walk out changed, transformed. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Open up our eyes. Open up our eyes, Jesus, to see the lost around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For those of you that might be coming to the um, outreach next month, I would love, you know, if you get a chance to read through these, to begin to sow some of these as gifts into folks as we reach out to them. But be directed by the Holy Spirit, however he leads you. So blessings, everybody. Amen.